everyone. Welcome to today's UF lecture, the first online lecture of probably a series of online lectures. This is a new format for us and we look forward to your feedback and your ideas on how we can improve. Today's lecture is going to be about rural support for right-wing populism. And the lecturer will not only explain why there is a lot of support for right-wing populism, but also point out ways how to change the situation. I'm very happy that Natalia Mamunova took the time to prepare a lecture for us and embrace the idea of a digital lecture for us. Natalia is a postdoctoral researcher with the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, UI, and the principal coordinator of the Emancipatory Rural Politics Initiative, ERPI Europe, which is a researcher activist community trying to understand rural support for right-wing populism in Europe and trying to understand how to build alternatives. Natalia holds a PhD from the Erasmus University in the Netherlands and her research focuses on populism, food sovereignty and agrarian movements in Europe, particularly Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Natalia has been a researcher and lecturer at Oxford University, the New Europe College in Bucharest, as well as Helsinki University. Without further ado, we will begin the lecture. Thank you, Julia, for your introduction. Yes, today we're talking about right-wing populism in rural Europe. As you know, populism has become a powerful political force in Europe. Well, it's not for the first time populist movements have been spreading across this continent, but the current wave is perhaps the most significant one since the end of the Second World War. European populists found great support in the countryside. Indeed, many French farmers voted for Marine Le Pen in the last presidential elections. Sweden Democrats became popular in the Swedish rural towns for its anti-immigration campaign. And Polish ruling Law and Justice Party has its main electoral base in the countryside. This is just to name a few examples. Nevertheless, the European countryside remain largely overlooked in the contemporary debates in the, in, on political crisis and the way out of it. Today my lecture consists of four parts. First, I will explain the relations between populism and the countryside. In the second part, I will discuss the causes of populist rise in rural Europe. In the third part, I will talk about populist strategies in gaining support in the countryside. And I will conclude with a discussion on possible solutions on these dangerous trends. I largely base this lecture on the recent research project I was working on together with my colleague Jami Frankese from University at Buffalo and other researchers from the Emancipatory Rural Politics Initiative. Together we were trying to understand the rise of right-wing populism in the European countryside as well as the forms of resistance occurring and the alternatives being built. So, let's start our lecture. What is populism? There are hundreds of definitions of this phenomenon, and none of them is perfect. Some scholars understand populism as an ideology, others as a political movement or a discursive frame. But what's central in populism is the idea of the people, who are juxtaposed against the evil, unfairly advantaged others, often elites or minority groups. How does it relate to the countryside, you ask me? Well, directly. If we look back into history, we will see that majority of these so-called people were peasants. The first populists were Narodniks, the political movement of Russian intelligentsia during the 19th century. Narodniks aimed to mobilize peasants against elites. They wanted to overthrow the monarchy and create a socialist society based on the principles of the peasant commune. Well, they failed and we all know what happened after that. Um, also, peasant and agrarian populism inspired the foundation of the People's Party in the United States in the 1890s. Uh, also, it was popular in Central and Eastern Europe during the interwar period. Then, radical political parties representing the peasant interests held power in Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. Only Hungary was an exception. This period was known as a Green Rising and was characterized by the ideological and political struggles between fascism, communism and capitalism. Well, talking about fascism, um, you might not know, but both Mussolini and Hitler won their first mass following in the rural areas. 
and by the way, the German Minister of Agriculture during the Hitler's rule was awarded the title Reich Peasant Führer for persuading Hitler to support peasants and villagers in order to increase votes. The contemporary European populists are certainly not fascists. Even though some might compare one to another, the primary difference is that uh, fascism was oriented towards the future, while the European right-wing populists are oriented towards the past, or more precisely towards an idealized notion of the past. They aim to restore the status quo in their homelands and return, to, return their national glory, which was presumably lost due to activities of the others – migrants, minorities, cosmopolitan elites, the European Union, and so on. But um, why do rural dwellers are so receptive to nationalist xenophobic appeals of European populists? In the contemporary mainstream debates, right-wing populism is portrayed as a result of economic or cultural crisis that hit Europe during the last decade. Indeed, the global financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis have exacerbated economic inequality in rural Europe, which influenced the villagers' support for populist parties. Likewise, the fears of losing the cultural identity due to globalization, multiculturalism and the refugee crisis made many people vote for populists. However, these arguments do not explain why in Portugal, for example, the country that hit hardest by the economic crisis, the far right remains only marginal. Meanwhile, Poland, that has one of the fastest growing economies in Europe, became completely paralyzed by right-wing populism. Likewise, if we consider the migrant crisis as a reason for right-wing populism, we will not be able to explain why the majority of rural dwellers in Switzerland voted to ban the construction of new minarets, while there are hardly any migrants in the Swiss countryside. The fear of immigration is the easiest sentiment to mobilize and manipulate, but it's not the cause of populism. Uh, the following maps depict the paradox of the populist rise. On the first map, you can see the electoral support for right-wing parties. The dark blue means the highest support. The second map shows the number of asylum seekers per million residents in 2018. Likewise, the darker color is the larger share. And the third map presents the GDP growth. The blue color means negative and the red positive growth. You can see that those countries that have least migrants and are better off have the strongest support for the right-wing populists. So, if we want to understand the spread of right-wing populism, we need to go beyond the dichotomy between cultural and economic factors and to find a deeper systematic trigger. In our research, we argue that the cause of right-wing populism in Europe and in the world is a fundamental crisis of globalized neoliberal capitalism. The last four decades were characterized by the spread of neoliberalism in different variations around the world. Neoliberalism sees competition as a defining characteristic of human relations and extends market principles in all spheres of life. It is associated with policies such as privatization, free trade, austerity and reduction in government spending. Globalization and European integration also follow the logic of neoliberalism by creating a single market and facilitating international migration flows. If earlier neoliberalism was seen as a market-based solution to socio-economic problems, now it's criticized for exacerbating inequalities, commodification of nature, limiting the power of democracies, and eroding the social bonds and solidarities among individuals. Neoliberalism has drastically transformed the European countryside. In many rural areas, it led to deindustrialization and deagrarianization. People lost their jobs and moved to cities. Many rural settlements became underpopulated. Today, 60% of European rural areas experience depopulation, especially in Eastern and Central Europe, where the more than 80% of rural regions shrunk. But what is most striking is how neoliberalism has transformed the ways in which food is produced, distributed and consumed. The neoliberal model of development has resulted in the expansion of large industrial agribusiness at the expense of small-scale family farmers. Let me show you a few diagrams. This diagram shows the scale of land concentration in Europe. You see, 3% of European farms now own 52% of agricultural land, 
while 75% of small farms are left with just 11% of the land. Many farmers found themselves trapped in a supermarket-driven value chain and tight dependency on banks and retailers. They either have to expand and become industrial food producers or get bankrupt. There is an increased rate of farmer suicide in Europe. For example, the French Public Health Institute revealed that one French farmer commits suicide every two days. Just imagine. This is 22% higher than that of the general population. The European Union Common Agricultural Policy is designed to support various food producers, both large and small. But, in fact, a great share of farm subsidies goes to large agribusiness. On this slide, you can see the top beneficiaries of the Common Agricultural Policy in 2009. Well, it's a bit outdated, but you can clearly see that the large multinational corporations received a lot of farm subsidies. In result, many small-scale food producers became marginalized or disappeared. The next slide shows the loss of agricultural jobs by country during the last decade. Most of these jobs are at small-scale farms. Just imagine, more than 900,000 farms disappeared in Romania, 600,000 in Poland, 300,000 in Bulgaria. In total, the number of full-time farmers across the EU fell by over one-third during the past decade, representing 5 million jobs. The crisis of neoliberal capitalism is directly linked to the crisis of representative democracies. The centre-right and centre-left parties, those that determine European politics since the end of the Cold War, established the so-called consensus at the centre, under the neoliberal hegemony. This resulted in the disappearance from the political discourse of the idea that there is an alternative to a neoliberal globalisation. Consequently, many people have come to believe that their governments represent the interests of markets and transnational corporations, while citizens' voice is unheard. This belief is especially strong in the countryside, where people feel excluded from decision-making at the local, national and European levels. Politicians used to ignore the interests of the rural population because of the following reasons. First, Rural votes are not decisive, as villagers constitute just 28% of European population. Second, the division between the urban and the rural is usually less pronounced in Europe, and therefore politicians appeal to the working class, not to rural dwellers. And finally, villagers are commonly perceived as apolitical, and thus not a reliable electoral group. Furthermore, there is no strong farmers' unions and civil society groups which could represent the interest of rural dwellers. Although there is some increase in rural mobilization and activism in Europe, rural protest groups remain mostly fragmented and only informally linked. The lack of solidarity and collective actions can be explained by various reasons. One of them is a neoliberal ideology that influenced people's lifestyles. It is based on three fundamental values. It's individualism, competition, and consumption. Well, we all know that individualization of the society limits their propensity for collective action. So does competition as well. I would like to say a few words about consumerism. Consumerism became a powerful ideology and a movement in Europe. It transformed citizens into consumers and thereby limiting their political engagement. Consumers are rather passive actors who influence politics through their consumption patterns. Consumerism has a huge impact on rural life, especially in the countries of Northern and Western Europe, where the majority of rural inhabitants are not engaged in food production. It's even called these days the consumption countryside. Some authors argue that consumerism contributes to the success of writing populists in Europe. In consumerist societies, Economic capital is important for maintaining social identities, while personal success or failure are measured by employment and welfare benefits. When people are unable to live up to salient social identities and their constructive values, they experience low self-esteem, shame and insecurity. These negative emotions are channeled into the anger and resentment towards perceived enemies, in this case, migrants, minorities, elites, and elected bureaucrats in Brussels. So,
let's move to their third part of our lecture on the populist strategy. European populists present themselves as the real champions of true democracy, who do not afraid to criticize the political establishment at home and those unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. There are those who speak on behalf of the ordinary people. It seems like democracy works, so what's wrong with it? Well, I'll answer you a lot. Right-wing populists treat on the fundamental values of the European Union equality, respect for human rights and dignity, democratic freedoms, and the rule of the law. They claim to represent the interests of the people, while in fact they represent elites. Let me give you an example from the countryside. The Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban expressed, expressed his support for family farming many times. In his election campaign in 2010, he appealed to rural voters and promised to support the Hungarian countryside and small-scale farming. This support was also central in his national rural strategy. However, this support never, had, uh, never materialized. Instead, Orban's party, Fidesz, became associated with representing the interests of corporations, oligarchs and land grabbing. Here, let me refer to Jean-François Bayard, who argued that populists offer liberalism for the rich and nationalism for the poor. They claim to be the protectors of national identity, while at the same time they negotiate better global terms for the elite. Yes, they often criticize transnational agribusiness and the common agricultural policy, but they do not offer any alternatives to neoliberal capitalism. On the contrary, as June Boris said, Populist leaders aim to preserve and defend capitalism in the name of the people. By blaming the migrants and minorities, they redirect the people's anger from the capitalist system and the elites and stream it against the most vulnerable groups. They have no ways to defend themselves. European populists use different strategies and tactics to reach out to rural voters. One of their tactics is misinformation, fake news and media manipulation. The years of neoliberal globalization resulted in declining role in the traditional community leaders, such as priests and rural school teachers, who were previously responsible for sharing and interpreting information in the countryside. Today, most of rural Europeans have access to the internet and smartphones, which enables right-wing populist agitation and fake news to reach mass audiences. However, if the propagandistic message doesn't have an archetypal base in the society, it's inefficient and most likely will be rejected. In their political campaigns, European populists often engage with narratives and symbols derived from the peasant culture. They appeal to rural communities as the true protectors of their national culture and heritage. Populists often use images of land, rural landscapes and ag agriculture to symbolize national sovereignty and national identity. For example, in Hungary, the fertile arable land is often discussed as a source of the national revival. Hungarian populists employ the ideas of land and farming to connect the nostalgic past with the present and to visualize the Hungarian nationhood, family and culture. In the United Kingdom, rural landscapes play an important role in populist mobilization. The British countryside is portrayed as a place of white safety and harmony, a symbol of Englishness, contrary to multicultural cities that mired in troubles and conflicts. Another tactic, uh, another tactic that populists apply to gain popular support in the countryside is the appropriation of progressive discourses of agrarian movements. European right-wing populists often talk about environmental sustainability, local food networks, slow food. Originally, these ideas are very liberal, socially inclusive and democratic. However, populists portray them in a very simplistic, nationalist, exclusionary way. For example, the Italian far-right Lega party often used the left-wing idea of made in Italy food. Initially, made in Italy food was associated with tradition quality, biodiversity, ties with territory. However, Lega Party formulated in very nationalist exclusionary terms, emphasizing the word Italy in its label. Today, European populists are trying to exploit the coronavirus in their interests. 
Indeed, they often blame the migrants, open European borders and the forces of globalization for the coronavirus spread. However, it's not always working in their favor. Uh, the harvest season will start soon and the European farmers desperately need seasonal migrant workers to work on their farms. Otherwise, we will be all sitting here without food uh, in the coming months. Several countries, for example Germany, have already lifted the ban on the migration of seasonal workers from other countries. Some experts um, speculate that the current pandemic might destroy right-wing populism. Well, it's too early to talk about this, but uh, the pandemic will contribute to our rethinking of the ways how food is produced, distributed and consumed, which may bring some positive outcomes. And next part of the lecture is exactly about this, so bear with me. Since the cause of right-wing populism is the failure of globalized neoliberal capitalism, cosmetic changes will not have a long-lasting effect. We need to change the entire system. But how to change it, you will ask me. Top-down initiatives are unable to do this. The resistance and alternatives should come from below. Recently, food sovereignty became discussed as having the potential to erode right-wing populism in the countryside. You might have heard about food sovereignty. It's very popular in the Global South and it's also gaining its strength in Europe. Food sovereignty is defined as the right of peoples to health and culturally appropriate food and their right to define their own agri-food systems. It is simultaneously an ideology, a social movement, a political project and an alternative model of development. Food sovereignty places the control over production, distribution and consumption of food into the hands of local food producers and consumers, away from the control of multinational corporations and supermarket chains. It aims to unite various food producers and consumers in a collective effort to create a sustainable, localized food system, which could be an alternative to the neoliberal agricultural model. Yes, it could work as a counterforce to right-wing populism. It proposes the transformation of the entire neoliberal model and it makes everyone an active actor in this process. Similar to right-wing populism, the food sovereignty movement aggregates different group interests into a homogenized voice people of the land against the constructed other, in this case against capitalist agriculture and the corporate monopolies on food systems. But contrary to populists, food sovereignty is a socially inclusive left-wing global movement that focuses on equality, social justice and cooperation across borders. The proposed relocalization of food systems could regenerate a sense of belonging and restore the local identities, which are important elements in fighting the regressive populism. But, there is always but. First of all, the majority of European farmers are so deeply integrated into the neoliberal agri-food industry, so any radical transformation would endanger their livelihood. Not many farmers would like to try this. Second, in Europe, the ideas of sustainable organic local food are mainly shared by progressive urban consumers, rarely by food producers themselves. Our research indicated there is a serious and very problematic rural-urban divide in Europe, which limits coalitions between farmers and consumer movements. While urban activists focus on sustainability and alternative food networks, European farmers are more concerned with preserving their way of life and farming. Sometimes farmers' discourses and practices are quite conservative and exclusionary and may support rather than undermine right-wing populism. The recent wave of farmers' protests in Europe falls into this category. You might have followed the news from the Netherlands, where live livestock farmers organized a number of protests in autumn 2019. These protests were triggered by the government proposal to limit nitrogen emissions. Uh, however, the farmers' demands went beyond lifting the climate change-related restrictions. They called for dignity and respect for their profession, for a better agricultural policy, for many, many other things. Uh, Dutch rural sociologist uh, Jan Dauw van der Ploeg uh, argued that Dutch farmers' protests were aggressively populist. Uh, farmers didn't recognize the fundamental crisis of neoliberal agriculture. They were fighting for the reproduction of the same order, which makes the crisis even worse. 
And here comes the pandemic. Um, well, I promised to tell a few words on the impact of coronavirus on populism in rural Europe. Um, uh, what I will tell you right now is very speculative. We still need to see how the world will change after that. But what's for sure, the world, the world will not be the same. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic exposed the weakness of the existing system and creates an opening to contest the neoliberal political consensus. But what's more interesting is the initiatives on the ground. The pandemic triggered a strong button-up social mobilization ar around local food systems. As restaurants are closed and supermarket shelves are empty, the local food systems are taking over the food supply chain. Many local food businesses and small-scale farmers have been packing vegetable boxes and delivering them to people's homes. Sales of seeds, seedlings and chickens have also gone through the roof as people create their own food security. I just came across a news article from Italy where former migrant farm workers from Africa, those who were so badly treated in Italy, organized a food cooperative and supplied fruits and vegetables to Italian families under the lockdown. This crisis has triggered something good in society, which is still difficult to name. Maybe it's the first real step toward the new sustainable agri-food system. On this positive note, I would like to finish this lecture. Thank you for your attention and good luck. Thank you, Natalia, for taking the time and preparing this lecture for us and for embracing these digital ideas that we had. Um, we're really happy that we can go on furthering international deba debates in these challenging times.